So welcome to our webinar today. Good morning. My name is Jeff Stauffer, um, Community Relations Director with Elville and Associates, and uh, welcome. We have which form of business entity is best for you presented by CEO and Chief Counsel Chuck Bork of the Bork Group LLC. Elbow and Associates is also very fortunate to have Chuck as special counsel to our firm, available to advise our clients on all business law related matters. Um, how this will work today, uh, you are on mute. However, if you have questions and we really want to encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, uh, please note them on the questions panel um, on the right-hand portion of your screen, and I'll be sure to forward them to Chuck during the presentation, and we'll pause during appropriate times to answer your questions. Um, you also, as always, receive the presentation beforehand um, through email ahead of time for your convenience to take notes on it if you wish. Uh, as always, for certified financial planners, CPAs, and other professionals on today's webinar, you may receive 1.5 continuing education hours for attending. So if I do not have it already, uh, for my records and per the requirements of the CFP Board of Standards and others, please email me your board ID. And for CFPs only, I do need the last four digits of your social security number um, for my reporting requirements. So please get that to me at your earliest convenience. Everyone will also receive a post-webinar feedback email right after the presentation. And we do ask that you please take just two minutes to fill out this simple survey to offer us your thoughts about the presentation, um, share with us some ideas about some presentation topics you'd like to see us offer in the future. And you also have some op an opportunity to request a time for a consultation with Chuck to discuss your planning needs as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce Chuck Bork right now. Um, Chuck is a business and tax attorney with almost 30 years of experience representing individuals, small businesses, and nonprofits. Chuck earned his joint JD and MBA summa cum laude from the University of Baltimore, where he was the editor-in-chief of the Law Review and the recipient of the 1993 Law Faculty Award. He also taught law students as a visiting professor and adjunct professor of law at American University and the University of Baltimore and has lectured at Dickinson Law School of Penn State University. Chuck has written for Thomson Reuters, Bloomberg BNA, and the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. His book on contract drafting is used by lawyers throughout Maryland and has been cited by the Maryland courts. Additionally, Chuck presents seminars to CPAs and lawyers around the country through his company, The Board Group LLC, including presentations to big four accounting firms and Fortune 500 companies. He lives with his wife, the youngest of his four children, and two dogs in Howard County, and is currently pursuing graduate work in theology and literature at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. So that is a little bit about Chuck, um, who we're very fortunate to have with us today. And we're going to get started, as we normally do, with a brief poll, um, just to get an idea of who our attendees are today and what's brought you today, to today's um, webinar. And our question for you today is what brings you to today's webinar regarding business entities? And your choices are, I'll go and get my glasses so I can read this here, is I am a new business owner seeking information and guidance on business entities. So I'm launching the poll right now. The second Option is, I'm a longtime business owner seeking information and guidance on business entities. Um, and the last option is, I am a financial advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So if you can just take a few seconds to cast your votes and offer us some feedback, we'd appreciate it. And we have some quick triggers here this morning. Most people have already voted, so thank you very much. We'll just give it a few more seconds here. Okay, so with most of the votes having been cast, uh, it looks like we have 42% saying, I'm a new business owner seeking information and guidance on business entities. 17% saying I'm a longtime business owner seeking information and guidance, and another 42% saying I'm a financial advisor 
here to learn to better serve my clients, which is always a good thing. So welcome back. All right. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Chuck. So give me just a second to switch controls and give Chuck the reins here so he can share his presentation. And Chuck, you should see that um, pop up there. And I can see you. Great. I'm going to turn my camera off so I'm not a distraction. And it's all yours, Chuck. All right. Thanks very much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um, well, welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, attending our podcast um, uh, this morning. Uh, today, our topic, of course, is what form of business entity is best for you. Uh, and as we'll discuss, uh, that's really an essay question. You know, there's no no formula, no secret formula that will tell you, you know, check this box and check that box, and then that's the entity that's right for you. There are a lot of uh, different facets to this question, a lot of uh, different concerns, um, a lot of different situations. Um, one type of entity might be right under certain circumstances in one situation, and if you change the situation a little, maybe a, a different type of entity uh, might be better. So what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about the parameters. We're gonna talk about the types of concerns you should have. And we're gonna talk about the options that are available. And generally when you use different types of options. But again, I, I wanna emphasize that uh, a decision about the right choice of business entity in any particular situation should be done in consultation. Uh, primarily consultation with a tax person, because as we'll see, uh, the uh, a major ramification, maybe the major ramification of business entity uh, is uh, tax considerations. And there can be vast tax differences depending on uh, your choice of entity. And again, uh, what those differences are and what those tax consequences are really depends on your situation. So it's not as if, well, there's one entity that's you know tax favorable in all cases. In addition to the panoply of entities we have, um, we also have a panoply of jurisdictions, right? You don't have to form an entity in the jurisdiction where you live or where your business is. You can form an entity in any jurisdiction. Now, having said that, I want to emphasize that there are some advantages and disadvantages in some cases for forming entities in different jurisdictions. But those advantages and disadvantages generally are not related to tax. All right, that's a very common myth that um, certain jurisdictions are better for tax purposes. The reason that's not true is because where you form your entity has nothing to do with how much tax you'll pay. What has what determines how much tax you'll pay from a for, from a state standpoint, first of all, right? From a um, the uh, from a, 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 a federal tax standpoint, it's irrelevant. From a state tax standpoint, what determines your state tax is where you're doing business, where your customers are. So it doesn't matter if you're incorporated, let's say, or form an LLC in Nevada or in Delaware or New Jersey or Maine. If your customers are all in Maryland or your customers are all in North Carolina, you're gonna pay tax in Maryland or North Carolina. So um, the advantages uh, that I speak about in terms of jurisdiction our other advantages are some administrative advantages, uh, in some cases, some liability protection advantages, and, I, and I'll talk about that today. Um, but that's the, the uh, those are the key things, I think, to understand. So with that, I'm going to go uh, and um, focus on my, my PowerPoint uh, presentation and, and walk you through, as I said, some of the uh, different issues uh, and advantages and disadvantages. Um, of, of various types of um, uh, business organizations. First of all, Jeff introduced me, so I won't go through this again, but um, I've been practicing tax law for a long time. I'm also a CPA and have, in fact, practiced as a CPA for five years. I was a partner in a CPA firm down in Bethesda. Uh, Jeff mentioned my book and, and my teaching. I've, I've been teaching almost as long as I've been a lawyer. Um, I graduated from law school in May of 1993 and by January of 1994 I was teaching as an adjunct, adjunct professor at the University of Baltimore so I've spent a lot of time teaching um, that's my contact information I'll show you that again uh, at the end of the session um, uh, I actually have two uh, emails because I, I not only run the board group but as Jeff mentioned 
Uh, I am a special counsel to Elbow and Associates, so you can reach me at either place, either Chuck at BorekGroup.com or Chuck at ElvilAssociates.com. And again, you can see my, my two uh, phone numbers for each of those two different places. And again, I'll share that screen with you again uh, at the end of the session. And uh, certainly I'd be happy to discuss with you any issues or concerns you may have. Um, and if you need us to assist you in, in choosing an entity or setting up an entity, uh, certainly I'd be more than happy to do that as well. But the first question that has to be asked, um, especially for new business owners, um, is whether you have a business at all. There's something called the hobby loss rules in the tax code under code section 183. The IRS believes that sometimes people engage in activities that might look like businesses, that they might think are businesses, but that as far as the IRS is concerned, are not really businesses. And what this all boils down to is whether or not you are entering into an activity with the intent to make a profit. So it's not about um, if you're in an activity that's, that's traditionally a business or, or anything like that. The question is, what is your intent? If your intent is to make a profit, well, then you've got a business. Uh, if your intent is not to make a profit, in other words, if you really don't care if you make a profit or not, you're just doing it because you enjoy doing it and it gives you some enrichment, well, that's not a business. And the, the reason that's important is because if it's not a business, you can't deduct any of your expenses. You still have to pay tax on any income you make, right? Um, under our tax code, you always have to pay tax on income. But if it's not a business, then all the expenses are considered personal expenses and there's no deduction for personal expenses. Prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which went into effect in 2018, you could take uh, um, deductions for what we call hobby uh, expenses on your uh, Schedule A as, as itemized miscellaneous deductions. However, the itemized miscellaneous deductions have been done away with. We don't have them anymore. So you can't take any expenses from a hobby. So it's really important um, to, to minimize your taxes that what your activity is, is considered to be a business. Now, how do you know whether it's a business or not, or, or how do we determine intent? Well, that alone is also an essay question, right? Um, there's the, the regulations provide nine different uh, factors. Um, and these cases come up all the time, by the way. Uh, the tax court has hobby loss cases every year, and usually several of them, sometimes as many as, as a, a half a dozen or a dozen cases a year that make it to the tax court. And the, the factors include things like whether you uh, operate it um, in a business-like manner. Do you have separate business accounts or do you intermingle the money with your, your personal accounts? Do you have a business plan? Um, if you're losing money, um, what do you do? Do you, do you change your, your operations in order to try to make money? That's, that's what a business does, right? If you're doing something and it's not succeeding, well, you don't keep doing that. You, you, you change it in some way. You, 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 you know, develop some strategy to try to make money. There's also in Code Section 183 a presumption. And the presumption is if you have made a profit in three out of the last five years, you're presumed to be in business for profit. Now that's a presumption that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you know anything about business, you know that it's not easy to make a profit. People generally don't make profit from activities accidentally. Um, usually you have to try. And so if in fact you have made profit in three of the past five years, that's a pretty good indication that you're trying to make a profit. The one thing I wanna point out to you about that um, if you should ever run into this, is that the IRS, in my experience, typically misapplies that presumption. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. The presumption that I just described to you only works in one direction, right? It's a presumption in favor of the taxpayer. It never works in favor of the IRS. And here's how that comes up. I've had several uh, audits, and I frequently represent clients before the IRS in audits. And over the years, I've had several audits that dealt with this issue of whether an activity was a business or a hobby. And in uh, the cases where it has come up, each and every time, the initial uh, response of the IRS auditor 
was that, well, look, you did not make profit in three of the past five years, and therefore you're not a business. But that's not how the presumption works. The presumption only works in your favor. It doesn't work against you. If you didn't make profit in the last three out of uh, five years, that means nothing. That's a neutral factor. It's only if you did make profit that you get an advantage that the presumption is that you are a business. So I just throw that out to you because that comes up a lot. And I suspect uh, it comes up in a lot more audits. I mean, I only see, of course, the audits that I handle, which are you know, just an anecdotal, uh, just anecdotal evidence. Uh, but I'm guessing it comes up a lot. And it's not because the IRS is trying to trick you. It's just because the, the IRS agents, unfortunately, are not always um, well-trained. That's actually a, a separate issue uh, that, that I want to mention as well, because I think it's important to all taxpayers. Uh, taxpayers uh, frequently believe that the IRS is the font of all wisdom about tax law, and that, that if somebody from the IRS tells you something, well, then that must be the case. Well, that's just not so, right? Um, IRS agents are, many of them, very good and, and, and lovely people hardworking, trying to do what's right, trying to do their job well. Uh, but uh, for the last, I don't know, I'd say maybe 20 years, um, in my opinion, uh, IRS training uh, has really been lacking. In fact, a lot of the IRS agents I know will tell you that. Um, they realize their training's not good. The IRS budget has been historically cut year after year. They're just now, uh, because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, starting to get more money. And frankly, even the more money they're getting now is, is more for upgrades in technology as opposed to training. So my point is not that the IRS is trying to trick you or beat you or something, uh, but um, they, they simply sometimes just don't know. And I think that's the case in, in each of those situations I described uh, where they got the presumption uh, regarding hobby losses wrong. And so there's two concerns that we primarily have when we're talking about choice of any two things we want to think about. The first one is liability. Now, there's a couple of really important things you need to know about liability. There's two kinds of liability that you have to be concerned about. One is direct liability, liability for stuff that you do. All right. The other uh, type of liability is referred to as vicarious liability, liability for something somebody else does, all right? And, and in terms of the types of things you can be liable for, there are two different categories. We, we call one torts, right? Like negligence, right? That's a tort. And the other one is contract liability. So let's try to unpack that a little bit. First of all, talking about torts, let's talk about negligence, all right? There is nothing you can do to immunize yourself from a claim of negligence. All right, there's a saying in the law that the tort feasor, meaning the person who commits a tort, is always liable for their own tort. So the fact that you are working in a company that's a, a corporation or an LLC, none of that matters. If you committed the tort, if the injury was caused by your personal negligence, you are personally liable. There's nothing you can do about that other than cover yourself with insurance, right? Um, for example, suppose you're a, a, a driver for UPS or FedEx or, you know, one of some, some delivery company. And as that driver for UPS or FedEx, which of course are big corporations, suppose you negligently drive your truck into somebody's, I don't know, house, right? And so you create damage because you, you you weren't you know looking at the road and you drove into somebody's house. Well, obviously you as the driver are negligent. That means that you're liable personally. Now you might say, well, gee, I've I've heard of cases like this, and typically they sue the company, right? They sue FedEx and they sue uh, UPS, and that's true. They might do that. In fact, they might completely ignore the driver and not even sue the driver. Why? because FedEx and UPS and those other companies have deeper pockets. And so they say, well, why waste our time suing the driver who probably doesn't have insurance that would cover this and doesn't have a lot of assets? You know, we're gonna get a recovery if at all from the company, so we're just gonna focus on them. Now, the reason the company is liable is because of that second type of liability I talked about, vicarious liability. 
right? Vicarious liability says that if somebody is doing something for you in a business context, right? So if you have an employee or even somebody who's not an employee, but just an agent, somebody who's doing something because you asked them to do it and they commit some sort of negligence, then the company, the employer, whoever the employer is, can be vicariously liable for that other person's negligence. And that's where liability become, liability protection becomes crucial. Right? It's bad enough that you might be liable for your own stupidity, right? your own bad acts. It's even worse to be liable for something somebody else did. All right? And that's where the liability protection of a business entity comes in. Now, the good news is that liability protection, as far as business entities are concerned, is pretty simple. You can achieve liability protection with virtually any of the business entities that are available to you that, that we're going to discuss in just a minute. Getting liability protection for vicarious liability is simple. That's really not a big issue anymore. Years and years ago, when I first started practicing, literally last century, right? Makes me feel very old to say that, but it's true. Last century, when I started practicing, that wasn't the case. And, and which business entity we picked, we had to be very careful because some business entities uh, would offer liability protection and others didn't. Well, that's just not the case anymore. We can get you liability protection in any entity. So it's really not an, an issue. The issue is understanding what that liability protection is. As I said, it's, it's for vicarious liability protection only, not for, uh, uh, you can't protect yourself with a business entity for liability for negligence that you commit yourself. It can also protect you from contract liability, but you have to make sure the contract is made with the entity and not with you. And I'll give you a, a story about that, that that illustrates that, I think, very nicely. Years and years ago, when I first started practicing, actually, um, a woman came to me and wanted to start a corporation. This was so long ago that LLCs really weren't even uh, being used at that point. But she wanted to start a corporation, and I, and I asked her why she wanted to do that. And she explained to me that she had a house cleaning business. And she said, look, I clean uh, lots of houses where there are expensive antiques and things. And I don't want to be liable if, if you know, something gets broken. And so I asked her how many employees she had. And she said, I have none. She did all the work herself. So she was the one personally that would go into the houses and clean things. And I said, well, the problem is, no matter what type of entity we form for you, if we form a corporation, if you negligently knock over somebody's, you know, Ming vase, and they, and they you know, sue you for uh, $100,000, the liability that you're uh, engaging in, whether it's a corporation or anything else, doesn't matter. Because that would be your personal liability. Um, I'm getting a message that my audio connection is lost, so I don't know if you all are hearing me or not. Can you hear Chuck, me, Jeff? I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. I just I had that pop up. I want to make sure. Okay. So, in any event, so so the corporation would not protect her from her personal. They could only sue the entity, so that would protect you from personal liability. I said, do you have any contract concerns? She said, well, yeah, I do. Uh, she had a lease. Um, and she said, you know, I want to put the lease into the name of the corporation. And I said, okay, we can do that. You know, have you talked to your landlord? Is your landlord willing to do that? And she said, sure. The landlord will, said they'll do it as long as I personally guarantee the lease. Well, obviously, if she personally guarantees it, then she hasn't escaped any liability. So that was a situation where the type of liability that she was looking for protection from was simply not available through a business entity, right? Her, her, her only protection from liability, from exposure to liability would be insurance. So the point is liability protection is easy to achieve in a business entity, but you have to be aware of what exactly it protects you from. It never protects you from your own negligence and never protects you from a contract that you've entered into in your own name. The other concern, of course, is tax. And in fact, Tax is the bigger concern. Now, the reason it's the bigger concern is because, as I said, liability is easy. 
we can get over the liability hurdle without any problem. You know, we, we the liability issue doesn't really um, limit our choices of business entity. All of the types of business entity forms are basically open to us and we can still achieve liability. Tax is a different story, however, right? Um, the tax ramifications vary greatly depending on what business entity you choose. So again, which is the best one? Well, as I said, it's not as simple as that. It's not like one business entity always gives you a lower tax liability. It depends. It depends on the facts and circumstances. It depends on what exactly you want to do with the business. It depends on whether you're starting a new business and whether you have other owners or not. It depends on whether you're merging with a business. It depends on whether you're looking for venture capital investors. It depends to some extent on whether you have employees. Uh, it depends on what your exit plan is, your, your business success and succession uh, strategy is. So there's no one answer but there are a bunch of variables and that's what we'll talk about in terms of the tax issues. What are the variables? What are the types of things that you should be thinking about? These are basically the tax choices for a business. There are basically four categories, uh, four tax frameworks, if you will, um, that, uh, that we can consider. Um, the first is just a Schedule C. Now, a Schedule C really just refers to um, a business that doesn't have any business entity form. In other words, just a sole proprietorship, one owner, and no corporation, no LLC, nothing like that. Um, if you have a business like that, your business activity gets reported on Schedule C of your Form 1040. Um, uh, and, you know, that just flows through whatever the uh, results of the business are, whether they're a profit or a loss, that just flows through to your income tax return, just as if it's a, you know, any other source of income, all right? Um, beyond Schedule C, there are three regimes in the tax code. There's subchapter C. Subchapter C is applied to corporations. Subchapter C is the general corporate tax framework. Now, in order to understand subchapter C, uh, the concept of it, you need to understand that under the law, a, a corporation in general, under the law, a corporation is a separate person in the eyes of law a separate person, separate and apart from all the owners, separate and apart from all the, uh, the officials, the officers and directors, the corporation itself is, is considered to be an artificial person. Now, as an artificial person, as any person, the corporation has to file and pay its own taxes, just like all the persons listening to me right now, right? You're all separate persons. You're responsible for your own taxes. And so it is with a corporation and subchapter C of the tax code goes through the rules of figuring out how much that person known as a corporation has to pay in taxes. Now with a small business, um, the connection between what the business earns and what the owners are going to earn is very close, right? And let me explain to you what I mean by that. In a big company, let's you know think about Microsoft or Exxon or somebody like that, right? The corporation earns income, and that income or some of it might flow through to the owners in the form of, of dividends, or it might not, right? Uh, not all of the profit likely is going to flow through to the owners. Some of it might, but it might flow at a later date. It, it, uh, the corporation will pay dividends to the shareholders when the board of directors decides to do so. And there's all sorts of factors that they um, that they consider when deciding whether or not to declare dividends. And so the, the determination of the dividends and when they'll be paid isn't so closely connected with the business. In other words, a dollar that Microsoft earns today, um, if you're a shareholder of Microsoft, isn't, you know, you, it's not like you're expecting to get your portion of that dollar in the mail next week, right? That's not how it works. There's a sort of a distance between when a big corporation earns a profit and when the shareholders actually get that profit in their pocket, their share of it. With a small business, however, the connection is generally more, much more close, right? If you have a small business, generally that small business is what you're depending to earn your living on. So when the business makes money, that money is going to go directly into your pocket immediately, as quickly as possible, right? 
um, you're not going to hold on to it, or at least not most of it, right? You might keep some in the business for expansion and things like that. But generally speaking, the money, there, there's sort of a direct connection, a direct flow from the money that corporation earns, the money your business earns, and the money that goes into your own wallet. Well, that, therein lies the problem with subchapter C. Subchapter C, we sometimes says, say, has double taxation, right? And what we... Chuck, Chuck seemed to have lost you there. Jeff, are you hearing me? Chuck, I can hear you now, yes. Yeah, it's, I, again, I, somehow it sort of dropped me off. Are you seeing my screen or do I need to share that again? Uh, no, see your screen, yes. Um, go ahead. You see the screen that says tax choices for business? Uh, let's see, I am. I am still on the two concerns liability um can you try to forward the screen yeah but i'm see, I, I have a different screen up i think i need to share my screen again let me uh try this again here okay all right you have it now yep got it now okay, there we go sorry about that folks a little bit of technical difficulty here all right, so uh, I was talking about uh, subchapter C and the problem. The problem with subchapter C with a small business um, is that you have double taxation. And what I mean by that is the, the the corporation, because it's a separate person, gets taxed on the earnings. And then when the corporation passes those earnings through to its owners, which is almost immediate in a small business, the owners have to pay tax on it again, right? So that's the double taxation. Well, we can avoid that double taxation with our other two choices. Our other two choices are subchapter K and subchapter S. Subchapter K is known as partnership taxation. Partnerships um, or anything taxed as a partnership is taxed under subchapter K. Now, subchapter K is actually the most flexible uh, portion of the tax code. And uh, if there is one uh, uh, approach to taxation that is is more prominent than the others with respect to small businesses certainly it's probably subchapter k because of the flexibility um, with subchapter k the income flows directly to the owners there is never a tax on the partnership itself never an income tax on the partnership itself um, so that's a big advantage with subchapter k uh, there are also other advantages structural advantages um, uh, flexibility in terms of allocation of profits and things like that. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Subchapter S is similar but different, and, and this is uh, a point I want to stress. Um, subchapter S is also a flow-through subchapter. Subchapter S is only available for corporations. All right, you have to meet certain requirements, and I'll talk about what those requirements are in a minute. Uh, but if you meet certain requirements and you're a corporation, then you can elect to be taxed under subchapter S. First of all, note that a subchapter S corporation is not a special type of corporation, right? S doesn't stand for special, nor does it stand for simple or stupid or anything else. Um, the S in subchapter S literally stands for the letter after R, right? Congress created subchapter S right after they created subchapter R. That's why it's called subchapter S. Subchapter S is just an alternative tax structure for corporations, right? 
corporations are different types of corporations you can form under state law. Corporations are always formed under state law. And again, I'll mention some of the different types of corporations that are available. But once you've formed a corporation, if that corporation meets certain requirements, then you can elect to be taxed under subchapter S rather than subchapter C. All right, subchapter S is a flow through regime similar to subchapter K, but not exactly the same as subchapter K. There are several differences. Uh, the big general difference is subchapter K is much less flexible. I'm sorry, subchapter S is much less flexible than subchapter K. So people um, sometimes sort of leap to this conclusion because subchapter K and subchapter S are both flow through subchapters. They sometimes think, well, they're both the same, then, right? Half dozen of one, six of the other, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. There are situations where subchapter K might be a perfect solution where subchapter S would be an awful choice to make. And there are situations where that could be just the opposite. Subchapter S and subchapter K are similar. They're sort of cousins, right? They, they both result in a type of flow through taxation. They generally avoid taxation at the entity level. And I say generally because although in subchapter K, you never have tax at the entity level, in subchapter S, sometimes you do. And there are really, really important differences. So don't ever conflate subchapter K and subchapter S and think they're basically the same thing. They're not. Now, under some circumstances, sure, it's possible that the, the result might be very similar or even the same, uh, but they have very different features. All right. So in terms of entity choice, it really boils down to four things, four different possibilities under state law, under Maryland state law, and in fact, under state law in every jurisdiction in this country now. Um, you know, limited liability companies began back in the 90s, uh, and there was a period of time where not every state had limited liability company legislation. That's no longer true. Every state has it. In fact, every state has almost everything, with one exception that I'm going to talk about today. Um, there are differences from state to state, and we'll talk about that as well. But every state has these four possibilities. You can form a corporation, you can form a partnership, you can form a limited liability company, or a trust. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each one of those different things. In terms of how you form them, forming a corporate, well, the, the simplest one to form, let me begin there, is a partnership in a sense. Um, and what I mean by that is a partnership is can be formed by a handshake. In fact, you don't even need a handshake to form a partnership. What the law says is whenever you have two people who are acting as co-owners of a business for profit, you have a partnership whether you know it or not. And the whether you know it or not part, I think is important because a lot of times people don't realize that they have partnerships. I will tell you, almost every business attorney you ever meet, if they've been practicing for long enough, will be able to relate to an experience where clients came to them not realizing they have a partnership. Because a lot of people think that in order to form a partnership, you know, certainly you must have to have signed something, right? Or have filed something, or at least have to have paid a lawyer something. Well, none of that is true. Um, I remember one time explaining this in a law school class um, and one of the students said, do you mean to tell me that you can form a partnership with just a handshake? And my response was, I mean to tell you that you don't even need the handshake, right? All you need is two people who are acting as co-owners of a business for profit and you got a partnership, whether you know it or not. And that means you have to file partnership returns. That means you have uh, the liability that flows from being a partnership as opposed to a corporation or some other type of entity. Right. So in that sense, a partnership is the easiest thing to form. It's not always the easiest, however, because whenever you do have a partnership, what you really want is a partnership agreement. That is crucial. And depending on the number of partners and the situation, partnership agreements can be extensive and expensive. Right? Um, you know, People often ask me, well, how much do you charge to, to uh, draft a partnership agreement? And I mean, the the range is, is almost infinite. I mean, I've I've done partnership agreements for you know under a thousand dollars, and I've I've done partnership agreements for ten thousand uh, dollars. In fact, more than ten thousand dollars in at least one case I can recall. So it depends on the complexity of the situation, the number of partners. Um, so that's the complex part of the partnership, not forming it, but uh, entering into the partnership agreement. 
the next simplest to form would be a limited liability company. Now with a limited liability company, you do have to file something with the state, but it's a really simple thing. It's not very complicated. Uh, and that's basically all you have to do. You, you file this document with the state, they're called articles of organization. Now the complexity with a limited liability company is just like a partnership, you're gonna want to have a, a partnership agreement, what we call an operating agreement in a limited liability company. So that's really where the complexity and expense comes in with a limited liability company, not in forming it, but in, negotiating and drafting that um, operating agreement. Corporations um, are the most complex to form uh, in the sense that you got to file articles of incorporation, you have to have bylaws, you have to have minutes of meetings, and you have to issue stocks. So there's lots of paperwork involved in a corporation. The good news is, depending on the situation, you may or may not need what we'd call a shareholders agreement. In a small, closely held corporation, uh, we may want a shareholders agreement. If we're going to elect S corporation status for tax purposes, we most definitely want a shareholders agreement. But because we don't have as much flexibility under subchapter S, uh, the shareholders agreement is not as hard to negotiate because you just don't have as many options. All right. So again, you know, people might ask me, well, which of those uh, three, the corporation, the partnership, or the LLC, limited liability company, which are easiest and least expensive to form? And the answer is any one of them could be. Any one of them could be easier or harder given the particular situation. Now, trusts I put in there because you can in fact run a business through a trust, although it's generally not advisable. Uh, we do have something called a business trust in Maryland, um, but it, it's generally not the most convenient way to run a business. So we, we very seldom use, usually it's a, a pretty unique situation where we'd recommend a business trust. In terms of types of corporations, there's lots of different types under state law now. Under state law, uh, Maryland law, and this is true in most states, there are different types. You have non-stock corporations, which are generally designed for nonprofit organizations. You have uh, uh, cooperatives, you have professional corporations. In some states you have farm corporations. So you have, you have a lot of different types of corporations. But what I wanna talk about are the three basic category, subchapter S, uh, subchapter C, subchapter S, or the professional corporation. Professional corporations, let's deal with them first. Um, they can only be formed by professionals, licensed professionals, lawyers, accountants, physicians, people like that. And it used to be, and this is starting to change in many states, um, it used to be that all of the owners had to have a license in that profession. So in a professional corporation that was a law firm, for example, all of the owners, all the shareholders had to be lawyers. In a professional corporation that was a physician's practice, all of the owners had to be physicians. That's starting to change. Uh, very gradually, uh, many states are, are starting to allow other people who aren't professionals, as long as they work in the business, to be, um, to be shareholders. You can always tell if a corporation is a professional corporation, by the way, because it's always designated as one of two things. And rather than saying Inc. or Corp in its name, it'll say PA or PC. PA and PC just stand for Professional Association, Professional Corporation, they're synonymous. So when you see a company, if you go to your, your doctor's office or your lawyer's office, right, and it says Smith and Jones PC, well, the PC just indicates it's a professional corporation as opposed to a partnership or something else. Every other corporation, as I said, or every corporation, including professional corporation, is going to be taxed under subchapter C or subchapter S. Subchapter C is sort of the default, unless you can elect subchapter S. There are several requirements in order to elect subchapter S. The main ones I have on the screen can't have more than 100 owners. So if you're going to have a lot of owners uh, in the corporation, S corporation status isn't available to you. Now, even with a lot of owners, frankly, there are, there are different types of um, complex structures we can uh, we can um, uh, create that can achieve S corporation taxation. That's a little bit about uh, beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. You can't have any foreign owners. Basically, all of the owners of an S corporation have to be U.S. citizen individuals, right? Because as the last box indicates, you can't have any entity ownership either. You can't have any other corporations as shareholders or partnerships or LLCs with one exception that I'll mention in a minute. Um, so those are the, you know, the restrictions on an S corporation. 
Um, the, the difference in flexibility comes from those restrictions. With an S corporation, as I said, like subchapter K, it's a flow through organization, right? The, the, the income, the profit flows through to the owners, but in an S corporation, it has to flow through based on the percentage of stock you own. So if you own 20% of the stock of an S corporation, you must get allocated, meaning you will be taxed, on 20% of the S corporation's uh, income. There's nothing you can do to change that. Uh, with subchapter K, we can modify how much profit flows through to the different uh, partners. Uh, so that's why one of the ways in which subchapter K is a lot more flexible. In terms of partnerships, there's really sort of a, a whole uh, menu, a, a broad range of partnerships. There's the general partnership or sort of the basic partnership. Now, general partnership is, is generally gone the way of the dinosaur. Most people don't want a general partnership because a general partnership doesn't offer you any liability protection. Uh, in a general partnership, all of the partners are jointly and severally liable for, for all partnership debt. Uh, back in the old days, I mean, I'm, you know, 30 years ago, that was the only choice you had if you wanted to have a partnership. So, um, you know, it wasn't like, you know, you might say, well, why would anybody ever choose a general partnership? Well, once upon a time, that, that's all you had available to you if you wanted to be a partnership. Now, however, in Maryland and in every state, we have something called an LLP or a limited liability partnership. Now, people sometimes confuse an LLP and an LLC. They're very different things, right? An LLP is just a partnership. It's essentially the same as a general partnership. In fact, it's exactly the same as a general partnership, except with respect to one thing. And that one thing is an LLP has made an election for its owners, its partners, not to be jointly and severally liable for the partnership debts. That's the only thing that distinguishes an LLP from a general partnership. Otherwise, it's the same thing. In fact, the law itself even says specifically that. It says that if you're a partnership and you elect to be an LLP, you're still the same partnership. You don't get a new tax ID number, you don't, nothing changes. It just uh, protects you from liability. So you might say, well, why would you ever form a partnership and not elect to be an LLP? And the general answer is you wouldn't, you know, basically, if you're if you want a partnership form, which might be desirable under certain circumstances, invariably you're going to elect to be an LLP, right? There's no reason uh, to hold your owners liable for partnership debts. The reason there are still general partnerships that exist um, are, well, I suppose there's a couple reasons. One is, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes people form partnerships and they don't even realize they formed a partnership. So if you don't realize you formed a partnership, then you don't know enough to make the election to, to be an LLP, right? And so uh, if, if you don't even realize you're a partnership and you've met the requirements I mentioned earlier, two or more individuals agreeing to share profits as co-owners, well, then you, you're open to partnership liability. Um, the second situation uh, that you might have a general partnership and not an LLP is simply a situation where people are, are just not well advised. Um, I do seminars uh, for CPAs uh, and lawyers, but mostly CPAs all over the country, right? Um, and on at least one occasion, and I think I, I was actually up in Alaska at the time, um, somebody in, in one of my seminars, I was talking about LLPs, and somebody in the back of the room raised their hand, and they said, well, we don't have those here. We don't have LLPs in, in Alaska. Well, at the time, I knew that that wasn't true because by the time I was doing that seminar, every state, all 50 states had enacted LLP legislation. But what it pointed out to me is that it might very well be that someone who's advising a business owner doesn't realize that there's this, this option of uh, electing to be an LLP. It's not like an S election, by the way. There aren't any you know, stringent requirements or anything like that. Any partnership can elect to be an LLP, and they should. So uh, if you currently have a business that is a general partnership, or if you're an advisor that uh, advises a business that is run as a general partnership, generally the advice I would give you is immediately after this podcast, call them, or if you're the business owner, contact SDAT and file your election to be a limited liability partnership. There's no reason not to, it protects you from liability uh, that is just you know unnecessary uh, to have otherwise.
Now, there's also a special kind of partnership called a limited partnership. That's not new. We've had those for, for literally for centuries. A limited partnership uh, is a partnership that was more important, frankly, before we had the LLP, right? Because before the LLP, you only had two choices if you want to be a partnership, general partnership or limited partnership. With a limited partnership, some, but not all, some of the partners can be protected from liability. But you always have to have at least one general partner uh, who is personally liable for the partnership debts. All right, so that was the big reason for an LL or for a limited partnership. Um, if you wanted to have a partnership structure for a variety of reasons and people wanted to come in as owners, they wanted to be partners, but they weren't going to be involved in the business and therefore they didn't want to be liable for anything the business did. Well, you could form a limited partnership. A lot of real estate investments are uh, structured that way, where you'll have a developer, right, who's going to run the development and they'll be the general partner, but they need a bunch of investors. Well, the investors don't want to be liable for stuff that the developer does. They don't know anything about what the developer is doing, right? They're not going to participate in the business. So they want liability protection. So you can structure that as a, a limited partnership and bring the investors on as limited partners. Right? Now, as I said, with the advent of the LLP, that liability protection is not so important anymore because we can achieve the same thing through just electing an LLP status. However, for whatever reason, you want to have a limited partnership, and there are some statutory differences. Uh, they're not profound, but there are some. And so it might be easier to form a, a limited partnership under certain circumstances. In Maryland, and in about, I think it's about 20 or 25 states now, almost half the states, we have an LLLP option, right? The LLLP functions very much like the LLP. Uh, the LLLP stands for Limited Liability, Limited Partnership. Right. So it's basically just a limited partnership that has elected to protect its general partner from liability, hence a limited liability, limited partnership. Well, you might say, well, wait a second, my head's starting to spin. Right. If we've got limited liability, limited partnerships, and the whole point of the limited partnership was to protect the, um, the limited partners from liability. And now not only do we have a limited liability, limited partnership, but we have an LLP. We can just form an LLP. Why do we need so many kinds of partnerships? Why doesn't everybody just form an LLP? That's a good question. And a lot of commentators have suggested that that probably will be the case in the future. I don't know how long into the future. I mean, we've had this structure for a long time and, and laws tend to change, especially business organization laws, tend to evolve over time. But after a few, many years, probably maybe in our lifetimes, um, you'll, you'll find that the limited partnership and the LLP and even the general partnership as a, as a functioning entity are, are probably gonna go away. So if you're gonna choose a partnership, you're probably gonna elect to be an LLP. Limited liabilities, there's actually some options with respect to limited liability company as well. You can have what's called a sole member or single member LLC. All right, what's designated on the screen as an SM LLC. Um, what that means is you don't have to have, unlike a partnership, right? A partnership always has to have at least two partners. An LLC doesn't. You can have just a single owner of an LLC. Um, now, the fact that you have only a single owner is important for tax purposes because the IRS says, all right, if you're a sole member LLC, that's fine, you're an LLC for state law purposes, so you get all the liability protection, but we're not gonna treat you as a separate entity. In other words, if you're a sole member LLC, your business uh, activities just go on Schedule C of your 1040. You don't file a separate return for the business, for the company, all right? So it's basically the best of both worlds. You get the protection uh, of being an LLC, right? The protection from vicarious liability, and contractual liability if the contracts are made with the LLC. But it's very simple from a tax standpoint. You just do your tax return like you normally would, like you were a sole proprietor. There's no special tax return you have to do for the LLC itself. Now, assuming that you have more than one owner, or even if you are a sole member LLC, um, you can elect to be taxed as a corporation. If for some reason you say, I wanna be, an LLC for state law purposes, because it's easiest to run. An LLC is a lot easier than a corporation in terms of paperwork you have to do every year and stuff like that. 
but I want to be taxed like a corporation because there are some tax attributes uh, that I may want to use as a corporation. Uh, and there could be a variety of circumstances uh, where that might be the case. Well, you can elect as an LLC to be taxed as a corporation. All right. um, and in fact, once you elect as an LLC to be taxed as a corporation, you can then elect to be taxed under subchapter S. So with an LLC, you can be taxed under subchapter K. You can be taxed uh, just on schedule C. You can be taxed under subchapter C or you can be taxed as subchapter S. In other words, with an LLC, you can be taxed in any of those four ways we talked about, depending on the circumstances and depending on your election. So you can elect to be taxed as a partnership, you can elect to be taxed as a corporation. And if you elect to be taxed as a corporation, just like any other corporation, assuming you meet the requirements, you can elect to be taxed under subchapter S. Right. Again, that's one of the great flexibilities uh, in using an LLC. Not only can you have flexibility in terms of management and allocation of profits, you even have flexibility in terms of what portion of the tax code you want to have apply to your business. And then finally, trusts, and I, and I don't want to spend much time on this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, trusts are generally not um, a form that we, we tend to uh, advise for businesses. There are some relatively rare circumstances where it makes sense to run the business in the form of a trust. Um, very commonly, uh, those situations involve lenders, uh, where a lender is, you know, where, where the business basically it consists of one substantial asset. Um, let's say that that you own a, some sort of a big piece of construction equipment, a, a construction crane, you know, one of those things that go way up in the skyscrapers, right, and cost millions of dollars. And that's your whole business. You simply own this crane and you lease the crane out to construction companies and you're gonna borrow money uh, to finance the crane. Uh, well, it might be that the lender, for the lender's purposes, would prefer that the crane be housed in a trust. Um, and that has more to do with the lending issues than with anything else. And so for that reason, it might be easiest just to run the business in that trust instead of having a separate organization. But it's situations like that, relatively rare, not, not your, Run of the mill everyday situation where you use a trust. Trust, however, might be owners of businesses. Um, and especially when we talk about estate planning, very commonly in a in a will uh, or in a testamentary instrument, uh, we will um, transfer a business or business interest into a trust. So the trust might act as an owner of the business. There is some some care that has to be taken there, however, because Remember when I talked about an S corporation, I said, generally speaking, you have to be a human being, a US citizen to be an owner of an S corporation. There are some limited circumstances where trusts can be owners of S corporations, um, but there are specific limitations. There's only a couple of kinds of trusts that can be owners of S corporations. So you have to be very careful with that. It, it, by the way, if, if an S corporation ever has an owner, that isn't qualified to be an owner, then the the S election immediately evaporates. Right, the day you the day someone who's not eligible to be an owner of the S corporation, in fact, becomes an owner of the S corporation, from that day forward, it's no longer an S corporation. Right, so, which is one of the reasons, by the way, you really want to have a shareholders agreement if you're going to form an S corporation, because you want to make sure that nobody is allowed to transfer their stock to somebody who will blow the S election, right? Um, so uh, shareholders agreements always crucial when you have an S election that has uh, an S corporation that has more than one owner. Okay, now another topic I wanna talk about because tax is so important in any choice. I wanna talk about the qualified business income deduction. This is a new deduction. It's in code section 199 cap A. It was instituted by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So the first year we had it was 2018. Um, and although we have two years under our belts of uh, applying the qualified business income deduction, it is actually a, a relatively complex piece of legislation. Um, there's lots of twists and turns as to when it applies and when it doesn't. When it applies, it's a great deduction because in some cases, and I'll describe in general what those cases are, you get to deduct 20% of whatever the income 
uh, your whatever your share of the income is from a business, right? That 20% of your share of the income, you know, becomes a deduction. So in other words, if you own a business as a partnership, let's say, and your share of the income from the partnership is $100,000, well, you get a $20,000 deduction, right? Um, that's pretty good. Um, however, the, the, the problem is it's not quite that simple. Um, as I say, there's lots of twists and turns, and we certainly don't have time in this short podcast to go through all of them, but I do want to talk about some of them just to give you a general idea. I will tell you that I do web uh, seminars, well, webinars these days mostly for CPAs, where we get into all the technicalities of uh, 199 Cap A, the Qualified Business Income Deduction, and I tell you, many of those webinars are eight hours long. We do full day webinars uh, on this topic. And even then we can, we don't really cover every nuance. So my point is just to emphasize to you that this is a complicated area um, and you really need somebody's help um, uh, to, to sort of um, guide you through the, the, the tax ramifications and make sure that you take full advantage of it. And And what business entity you choose, as we'll see, will determine to a large degree whether or not you can take advantage of it. Let's just talk about some of the basics. First of all, the Qualified Business Income Deduction itself is really three different deductions. It has three different independent components. The first one is the 25% of Qualified Business Income from Qualified Trades or Businesses. That's what we're gonna talk about. That's sort of the main component. When people talk about the Qualified uh, Business Income Deduction, that's typically what they're talking about. However, in addition to that, there's also a component for qualified REIT dividends, real estate investment trust dividends, and publicly traded partnership income. Those two things together form a separate component. So even if you don't have any deduction emanating from your qualified business income, you might still have a qualified business income deduction from your REIT dividends and your publicly traded partnership income. And then there's what I think of as a third component. Um, not everybody thinks of this as a third component. Some, some will think of it as just a modification of the, the first component, but uh, there are special rules if you are the owner of an agricultural or horticultural co-op. Um, there are some very special rules uh, with related, uh, related to uh, the Qualified Business Income Deduction. So that's kind of a separate category. We're not gonna talk about that today either. I'm gonna focus on that first category, um, the, um, the uh, uh, qualified business income category. Question came in, by the way, I want to address. It says, if taxes C corporation, can a company then deduct premiums for an executive benefit long-term care plan set up for the executive? With a long-term care plan, uh, as long as you meet the the um, uh, requirements under Code Section 401, yeah, the, the corporation could deduct it. Um, you generally cannot deduct premiums on life insurance if the corporation is the beneficiary of the life insurance. Right, uh, so that might be what's triggering that question. Uh, if, if you know, oftentimes a corporation will will buy key man, or what we used to call key man, key person, I guess would be the more appropriate term, or executive life insurance, so that if the you know the key person uh, dies prematurely, the corporation uh, gets an influx of money that it can use to you know recruit and hire and um, you know uh, compensate itself for the loss of that individual. Those premiums can't be deducted. Uh, but long-term care insurance premiums, just like health care insurance premiums, can be deducted uh, as long as the benefit plan um, uh, meets the requirements under Code Section 401. All right. There is an overall limitation uh, on the qualified business income deduction. The limitation is either 20% of your combined QBI, and when I say combined QBI, qualified business income, that means if you have more than one business, you get to combine them all, and it's 20% of that. Or if it's less, 20% of your taxable income, or specifically the amount of your taxable income in excess of your capital gains. In other words, you take your taxable income, subtract out your capital gains, and then 20% of what's left over is the overall limitation. You can never have a qualified business income deduction more than that, right? 20% of your taxable income. Um, so if you if you earned a hundred thousand dollars from a partnership, but because of other deductions you have, you know, and, and other things going on with your tax return, your taxable income at the end of the day is only uh, fifty thousand dollars. 
well, then your cap is 20% of that $50,000, all right? Um, 20% of your taxable income without regard to your, your capital gains is the maximum you can take with a qualified business income deduction. Just one of the sort of twists and turns that I mentioned. What kinds of business are qualified businesses for this purpose? Well, basically they have to be US businesses or specifically in the terms of the statute, they have to be effectively connected with the conduct of a US trader business. So if you have any foreign operations, if you, if you have business, um, a business that does business that generates income in Canada or in Mexico or any place outside of the United States, that income doesn't count. The second thing is the only income that counts for purposes of this deduction is operating income. So to the extent you have capital gains, for example, or income from interest or dividends, to the extent the business has any of those types of income, it doesn't count. Uh, it's only income from operations. Now here's a real big issue, and this is, is really important, maybe the most important thing I'm gonna say about the qualified business income deduction. If you have a subchapter S corporation, and the owner works for the subchapter S corporation, performs any activities for the subchapter S corporation. The tax law says that that owner, that S corporation shareholder, has to be paid a reasonable salary. Now that's been important in the past because uh, for employment tax purposes, right? Some people would say, well, I'm gonna form an S corporation and I just won't pay myself any salary. And if I don't pay myself any salary, then I don't have to pay any employment taxes. Well, the law says you can't do that. You must pay yourself a reasonable salary before any money coming out of the S corporation is considered anything other than salary. In other words, if you don't um, uh, use a reasonable salary, the IRS will just treat it all as salary and you'll have to pay employment tax on everything uh, that you get from the S corporation. So that employment tax issue has been with us for, for decades, literally. Any audit of an S corporation, uh, they're always going to look at the salaries paid to the owners. And if they believe the salaries are too low, that they are not reasonable salaries, they'll adjust that and you'll have an, uh, an employment tax uh, liability as a result of that. Now, however, there's an even more important reason uh, for that reasonableness requirement. To the extent of your reasonable salary, if you're an S corporation shareholder, you cannot get a qualified business income deduction from that business. Let me explain this with an example. Suppose, and let's just keep it simple. Suppose you're a, um, a, a single shareholder, right? You have an S corporation and you're the only shareholder. And let's say that S corporation generates $100,000 of profit, right? $100,000 before you paid yourself anything. And you say, well, um, I'm just gonna pay myself some nominal amount. Maybe you're the one that runs the business, but you say, I'm just gonna pay myself $10,000 in salary and everything else I'll just take as a distribution from the S corporation. So the $10,000 in salary, I'll pay the employment tax on. When I figure my qualified business income deduction, I'll get 20% of that $90,000 that's coming to me as non-salary income from the S corporation. The problem is if you get audited, the IRS might come along and say, well, wait a second, $10,000 is not a reasonable salary for you. A reasonable salary for you, and that's always an essay question too, right? It's based on the facts and circumstances. But they might say a reasonable salary for you is the whole $100,000. So it's all salary. And because you don't get any qualified business income deduction for wages or salary, you don't get any qualified business income deduction. Or they might say the reasonable salary is $50,000. So you only get a qualified business income deduction for $50,000. The problem is whenever you have an S corporation, if you're, if you're actively involved in the S corporation, you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. And whatever that amount is, you don't get the qualified business income deduction for. All right. So being an S corporation in most cases is going to reduce the amount of your qualified business income deduction. Now let's look at it in the other, from the other perspective, from subchapter K, partnership taxation. Suppose you have an LLC and you're taxed under subchapter K. Well, unlike an S corporation, you don't have to pay yourself a salary. In fact, you can't. Um, technically under the law with a partnership or anything that's taxed as a partnership, um, a partnership cannot, a partner, I should say, cannot be an employee. Um, 
and that's because in the eyes of the law, each partner is is a is an owner, like almost like a sole proprietor, even though there may be more than one of you. Um, and so you can just like you can't be an employee of yourself, you can't be an employee of your own partnership. So the good news is you you don't you don't have to reduce um, the um, uh, the amount that's generated from that partnership for purposes of the qualified business income deduction. The problem is every dollar that that is allocated to you from a partnership is subject to employment tax, right? So you have to to weigh the consequences. So what's what's uh, better for me, the qualified business income deduction or the employment tax? Generally speaking, you're going to get more benefit from the qualified business income deduction. It's going to be a higher deduction. It's going to overcome the additional uh, cost of the the employment tax. Uh, but that's not always the case, right? So it's it's one of those factors that has to be weighed. Uh, it has to be weighed, I should say, to determine what makes most sense for you in a particular situation. And of course, that, of course, it all becomes complicated when you have many owners, right? Because the different owners might be in different situations. One uh, choice might be better for some of them, and one choice might be better for others. Uh, and that's where you have to, you know, uh, sort of do those pros and cons and and decide what makes sense under your particular situation. By the way, if you have a rental property, there was a big question um, surrounding this when, when Congress first enacted the Qualified Business Income Deduction. The question was, well, can you take it for profits from a rental property? And originally it looked like, no, you couldn't. And then there was something in the proposed regs that made it look like, well, maybe you can. And then they retracted that part of the proposed regs. And so we said, well, we don't know if you can or can now. Well, fortunately, the IRS issued this notice in 2019. And in fact, that notice has now ripened into proposed regulations. And what it says is, look, if you meet these three requirements, then you can take a qualified business income deduction from a rental property. First of all, you have to have separate books and records for the rental property. Now you can combine, if you have multiple rental properties, you can you know, combine them all as one group. But you have to have separate books and records. They can't, you can't commingle it with your personal uh, uh, books and records. You have to spend 250 hours of rental services. Um, now, currently, that that's 250 hours for the year that you want to take the deduction. Starting in 2022, it's just going to be three out of every five years. Um, the good news is rental services um, is relatively easy to meet that requirement. Basically. And this is not material participation, right? Sometimes if, if you're familiar with the passive activity loss rules, you might be familiar with a concept called material participation. This is not that. This is actually much easier to meet than material participation. Things like collecting rent, negotiating with, with tenants, fixing, you know, doing repairs and maintenance, all that thing, uh, you know, taking out trash, all that stuff. And by the way, you don't have to do it personally. You can pay somebody to do it, right? So you can have uh, agents, you can have a, a, a real estate um, management company do it for you. As long as you're paying for it, it counts. So as long as that adds up to 250 hours during the year, you've met the second requirement. And the third requirement is that you have contemporaneous records of those rental services. In other words, you can't wait until you get audited and then say, well, let me go back and figure out how, many, how much the rental services were. You have to keep an ongoing you know, accounting of an ongoing tracker. But if you meet those three requirements, then you're allowed to treat your rental property just like any other business for purposes of the um, qualified business income deduction. Now the IRS goes out of its way to point out that if you meet these requirements, it only applies to the qualified business income deduction. So there's all sorts of other rules, uh, most importantly, the passive activity rules that I mentioned earlier uh, that deal with rental property. So you know these, these rules don't apply to those things. It only applies to the qualified business income deduction. There are also a couple of what I call kickouts. Um, if the property was used as your residence at any point during the year, even for one day, then you can't use the safe harbor. By the way, that doesn't mean that the, the rental property is not going to be treated as a trader business. Whether or not the rental property is, uh, is treated as a trader business is really a facts and circumstances test, right? The notice that I just showed you is a safe harbor, right? The nature of a safe harbor is that the IRS says, look, if you meet these certain requirements, we won't argue with you. We won't make an issue of it. So that's what the safe harbor is. So if you've used the, the, the um, uh, real property as your residence during the year, you can't take advantage of the safe harbor. You might still be able to argue 
that the rental activity is a trader business, right? That's a separate issue. The other kick out is if you have a triple net lease, that basically means that the tenants pay for everything. They pay for the taxes and the maintenance, and you basically just sit at home and collect rent checks, right? Uh, the Supreme Court a long time ago, and when I say a long time ago, I literally mean 1946. In 1946, the United States Supreme Court said a triple net lease does not constitute a business, right? With a triple net lease, you're literally just, you're an investor, right? You're, you're just collecting rent checks. You're not running a business. There's two limitations uh, that can get a little complicated. Uh, with the, respect to the uh, 199 cap A deduction, I'm going to run through these relatively quickly because they are a little complicated. Um, but I think you should just have a general idea of what they are. First of all, there's the W-2 wage limitation, and then there's something called a specified service trader business limitation. With the W-2 wage limitation, it says that your qualified business income that you count for purposes of the deduction um, can't be any more than 50% of the W-2 wages paid by the business, right? And if it's an S corporation, that would include the W-2 wages paid to you. Or if it's more, 25% of the W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the unadjusted basis of qualified property. Unadjusted basis of qualified property basically just means the cost basis, whatever you paid for the property. The reason we have that complexity is because of the real estate lobby, frankly. Uh, when Congress was first um, uh, drafting this legislation, the W-2 wage limitation just had the 50% of W-2 wages. That was the only limitation. And the real estate industry lobbied Congress, right? And they 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 went up to the Hill and they said, well, wait a second, we you know we spent a lot of money taking you guys out to you men and women out to dinner and lunch and stuff and and uh, you know schmoozing you. Uh, we need to get some of this. The problem with the real estate industry is very very frequently they have very little W-2 wages. And so they said, we'll never be able to take advantage of this. However, in the real estate industry, they tend to have lots of property, sometimes millions and millions of dollars of property. So that's why they have this alternative test where you can use the limitation can be just 25% of the W-2 wages plus 2.5% of the cost basis of property. Now, 2.5%, you might say, well, that's pretty small. But if you've got millions and millions of dollars of property, then it, you know, it, it makes the limit very big, all right? So that's the W-2 wage limitation. Second limitation is the specified uh, service business, um, or sometimes called the specified, uh, um, trader, ser specified service trader business limitation. These are the specified services, what you see on the, on the uh, screen, health, uh, law, accounting, actuarial science, et cetera. The general rule, and I'm about to tell you about a, a big um, exception to the general rule, all right? So, so don't get too nervous yet. But the general rule is, if you're in any of these businesses, you're not entitled to a qualified business income deduction. So if you're in the brokerage services business or consulting businesses or law or accounting, any of that stuff, and look at the last one. The last one is the scariest one, right? Any trade or business where the principal asset is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees or owners. Well, golly, that, that could describe almost any business. Well, there's two pieces of good news here. First of all, the regulations uh, uh, define each of these trades or businesses. Now, some of them are exactly what you'd expect them to be. Um, health basically means any sort of health care business. So uh, business meaning businesses where there's a, a professional who treats patients. It doesn't include things like um, generally pharmacies or labs or health clubs, anything like that. It's basically just, you know, doctor patient type businesses. Law and accounting, those are things you'd actually expect them to be. Actuarial science, you know, that's one of those things, if you're an actuary, you know you're an actuary. Um, you know, performing arts is fairly straightforward. Consulting is a little bit tricky because there, although it is defined um, in the regulations, it's still pretty broad. It doesn't include things like training. So if you are um, training somebody how to use products, let's say you're selling something and you spend time training them, that doesn't uh, constitute consulting. Let me jump down to brokerage services. Brokerage services specifically excludes real estate and insurance brokerage. So real estate brokers and insurance brokers are not considered to be a share business. And then finally, that last one, that scary one, the one that seems like it could cover almost anything, 
the regulations actually makes that last category very narrow. Uh, the last category is what I refer to as a celebrity category. It only applies if the income from the business comes from appearance fees or endorsing products or the use of your uh, image or likeness. So in other words, if you're a celebrity, right, th those are the only people who get paid for any of those things, uh, then you'd fall into that last category. All right, so remember the first sort of uh, 10,000 level, 10,000 foot level understanding of this is that if you're in any of these activities, you can't take the qualified business income deduction. However, there's a threshold. And the threshold says if your taxable income, right now I'm talking about taxable income here, that means your income after your deductions without regard to your qualified business income deduction. But you're, if your income after your other deductions is less than $326,600, assuming you file married joint, or less than $163,300 if you file anything other than married joint, those two limitations I just told you about, the W-2 wage limitation and the specified service trader business limitation, they don't apply at all. So it doesn't matter if you're an accountant or a physician or what type of business you're in. It doesn't matter if you have any W-2 wages. If your taxable income before the qualified business income deduction is less than those amounts, you can ignore those limitations. They simply don't apply to you. Now, they don't begin to apply immediately thereafter. There's a phase out range, right? Uh, for married filing joint people, uh, the phase out range is 100,000. For everybody else, it's 50,000. And what that means is if you're in the phase out range, you get a partial qualified business income deduction. Now, if you're above the phase out range and you're in a specified service trader business or you don't have any W 2 wages, then in fact, you know, those limitations apply and it would preclude you from taking qualified business income deduction. All right. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of how complicated this really is. It's it's not simple, you know, and, and I, I emphasize that because I've had a lot of clients when they've heard about this and they've read about it in the news or or, or something and they think that, well, it's just, you know, I take whatever my business income is, I multiply it by 20% and that's my deduction. Eh, not necessarily, right? There, there's, there's, there's several twists and turns to it. Um, and again, what kind of entity you formed, as I mentioned, can have a big impact on that, right? If you have an S corporation, then you have to worry about the, the reasonable compensation. If you have an LLC or some, anything taxed under subchapter K, you don't have the reasonable compensation issue, there is a, a um, concept known as a, um, a fixed payment or what's, what we call a guaranteed payment in partnership law. Uh, and that uh, will have the same effect as a reasonable compensation under an S corporation, but there are ways around that. Again, because subject K is a little more flexible, we can usually avoid that problem. Um, C corporations, by the way, don't get any qualified business income deduction. Bus qualified business income deduction is only gonna be generated, if at all, if you have either just a sole proprietorship that you have a Schedule C with, if you have something taxed as a partnership, either a, an actual partnership or a limited liability company, or if you have an S corporation. Right. Oh, trusts as well, by the way. Trusts also do generate qualified business income deduction. All right. So given all the things we said, what are some of the considerations that you need to keep in mind? Well, um, among the things that I would ask, for example, if you came to me to talk about business entity choice, if it were a new business, I'd ask you, will you have employees or any other agents? That's you know maybe a liability thing. Um, as I said, there are some cases where liability protection won't be any good. If you don't have any employees or agents, uh, you have to protect yourself through insurance. You might still want to form an LLC uh, in, in the you know case you need it in the future. It's not very expensive to, to create or maintain, uh, but those are issues that we think about. Um, are you going to own real estate? Um, for tax purposes, we generally don't like to put any appreciating asset into a corporation. There are tax advantages to putting real estate uh, in a, um, a pass-through entity like a, an LLC. Uh, do you have multiple different businesses, right? Um, you don't have to use the same entity for each business. Um, by the way, if you have real estate, typically what we do is we put the operating entity in one business typically an LLC or a corporation maybe, uh, and we put the real estate in an LLC. And then the operating business simply leases the real estate from the real estate LLC. Do you anticipate initial or subsequent losses? 
Well, if you're going to have losses in a C corporation, the losses stay in the corporation. In an S corporation or a partnership or something that's taxed as a partnership, those losses come out to you. So that's a fact. Do you plan to attract investors? Depending on the situation, investors may, may not want to invest in uh, uh, an LLC or a partnership. Or the investors that you may want to attract are investors that would be eligible to be S corporation shareholders. So again, the facts and circumstances have to be considered. We be able to take advantage of the, the QBI deduction. I mentioned the drawback with an S corporation, but if your taxable income is above the thresholds we talked about, then it doesn't matter. Then there's there's no disadvantage to the reasonable compensation requirement under subchapter S. So again, those things have to be considered. Will there be multiple owners? We talked about that. It, it becomes imperative that you have an ownership agreement. Do you plan to pass the business to your children? There's lots of different ways of doing that. We sometimes use a, a family, what we used to call family limited partnership. These days I refer to them as family limited liability entities because we can do the same thing basically with an LLC. And those have certain estate planning advantages. And finally, what's your exit strategy? You know, uh, when somebody's starting a business, typically they're not focused on what, how they're going to get out, what their exit strategy is. But exit strategy is actually a very important thing, uh, thing to think about as early in the process as possible. Right, well, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, there again is my uh, contact information. You can contact me either place um, uh, at the Bork Group, Chuck at BorkGroup.com or Chuck at ElvilleAssociates.com. Uh, you see the phone numbers up there, 410-988-3820. Uh, for the board group, 443-393-7696 for Elbow and Associate. You can reach me at any of those places, and I'll be happy to talk about your situation with you or if you have any questions. And with that, Jeff, I think we've concluded our time. Well, thank you, Chuck. Um, let's give Chuck a virtual hand. Um, a lot of great information and uh, we appreciate your time and knowledge and expertise. I know I certainly learned uh, a tremendous amount um, and uh, I wish I knew all that information when I was uh, uh, back in my banking days um, uh, assisting clients, um, but I wish I knew you to refer them to as well. Um, anyway, um, now is your time, uh, everybody. Uh, we're getting lots of comments. so. Terrific presentation um, uh, to you, Chuck, uh, from our attendees. So thank you. Um, now is your time for last uh, a chance for questions for Chuck. Um, and obviously, you have his contact information uh, to follow up with him. Um, yeah, lots of uh, responses here um, saying thank you, Chuck. Um, I appreciate it. One participant had mentioned that they have, have the same CPA stamp poster that I have here in my office. Um, and I didn't realize how old that was. Somebody asked me about that the other day and I realized it's a 22 cent stamp. That, that was a <laughs> long time ago. But it's a nice poster. So um, a couple closing thoughts. Um, so uh, we're going to have Chuck back, uh, which is good news. Um, and sometime in January, for a date to be determined, we're going to be talking about uh, integrating your business and estate plans. Um, so we'll make sure we get that information out to you uh, on a date to be determined. Um, Chuck and I will confer um, and get that uh, uh, date uh, specified uh, out to you um, very shortly. Um, so uh, we do have a couple of events uh, coming up very soon here at Elbow and Associates. Um, on the 23rd of October, we have our um, trustee selection workshop, which is a quarterly event that we host. It's very popular. Um, we have a new presentation uh, talking about VA aid and attendance, um, uh, the uh, pension that's uh, very important and uh, uh, pertinent to some people uh, on the 27th of October. And on October 30th, um, uh, our very uh, popular presentation of what families need to know about planning for a loved one with special needs uh, is coming back. Um, that's always something that a lot of people like to attend. So um, information um, has been sent out um, and will be sent out about those presentations if you're interested in attending. 
They're also on our website. Um, and also, um, again, if you need to get in touch with Chuck, his information's there. Um, we have some information about our uh, business services uh, on our website, uh, of which Chuck can be of service to you on. And um, we appreciate your comments uh, on our post-webinar feedback as well, as always. And um, I think if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to double, double check. Um, we'll go ahead and call this a wrap and a success. Um, let's see here. No, I think that's everything for today. So thank you again, Chuck. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And we look forward to seeing you all on another webinar soon. Have a Bye. great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.